Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, hello. Welcome back to WJCT Studios. I'm a lot of frequent guests here, and I appreciate you coming back. Again, Michael Boylan, President and CEO of WJCT, your favorite public television station. Probably because, hopefully, the only one. But <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy seeing so many of you here. It's nice to see folks who take a particular interest in their health and their health information that we're providing you. And we've been doing now approaching 12 years in our relationship with Baptist Health Systems in this process. So we really are very excited about it that. And as a matter of fact, we are, as you can tell by the uh, save the date card, we're already, August is almost upon us, football season again. So you, you lose your husbands for a few more months, but that's all right. Sometimes that's not a bad thing, right? Uh, but we do have the upcoming event, and I wanted to show you a promo to get you excited about, uh, about attending this year's uh, Speaking Women's Health conference. So if we could roll that for me, please. WJCT and Baptist Health present the annual Speaking of Women's Health Conference, August 25th. Get your tickets early and be entered for a chance to participate in keynote speaker and PBS personality, Dr. Joel Furman's 2012 Health Getaway in Amelia Island, August 19th through the 25th, a $1,600 value. For more information, visit wjct.org slash events. Uh, if you've, how many of you have seen the Dr. Furman on WJCT? Well, he's actually hosting, as you saw, a conference up at Amelia Island. And if you register early, I'm not sure what the drop dead date is on there, uh, the deadline for that, Donna. Uh, 25th? July 25th. I guess drop dead wasn't a good choice of words, was it? <laughs> the deadline for pre-registration is July the 25th. So if you register now to be part of that conference, and you know you're gonna go, so you might as well do it now, you will be entered in a drawing that allows you to participate in his weekend conference up in Amelia Island, which as you saw, it's $1,600 value. So it's a great motivation for you to, to do that. Now, I also know in this room there, are, okay, maybe you have troubled hearts because we're talking cardiovascular today, but also you are women with big hearts. And we've got another, another wonderful event coming up in the next two Fridays, Friday, Saturday, in a, in not this weekend, but the weekend thereafter. And I've got a little promo to show you. So if we can go ahead and roll that, that second promo, please. The Jacksonville Film Festival and WJCT present three sing-along screenings of the original Muppet movie, Friday, June 22nd at 4 p.m. at the Ponte Vedra Concert Hall and Saturday, June 23rd, two showings at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. at the WJCT studios. Tickets for all showings are $8 and can be purchased online through WJCT. Visit wjct.org slash events for more information and come be a part of the fun. It's, how many of you saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Have you been there where you do that kind of stuff? Well, this is it for little kids. If we're taking them up at movie and we're bringing in characters, and I think we're going to try and get uh, Sharon Henson, Heather Henson from the Henson family, is looking to try and get her herself to be part of this program. But that's great. We have characters here. We play the movie. The kids sing along with the movie. They get a little goodie bag so they can do poppers and wear the, the things they saw. It's a great family event. The cost is only $8, and that largely just covers the cost of us accessing the film and the goodie bags for the children. So if there's a flyer on your table, so please take a copy of that with you. And if you uh, are so inclined to really uh, get your children, your grandchildren excited about uh, what a great thing grandma is, here's an opportunity to demonstrate that in that process. Not that you're all grandmothers. I'm not assuming that, of course. I get myself in trouble up here all the time. So, you, But by now, you should be used to that, the most of you. So I do appreciate it. Anyway, a, a couple of great examples of how we really look to reach out and serve this community in a variety of different ways. So we have learners of all ages, and that's what we're all about, and we do appreciate your time and, and effort to be here today. We have a very special guest today. Obviously, you would not, uh, you're here because you care about this comment, uh, these, this uh, heard a presentation today. And I want to introduce, if I could at this time, however, the executive director or the director of the Cardiovascular Services for Baptist Health Systems, Susan Allen Umerly, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Susan. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Are you all happy to be here today? Yeah. Was it a good lunch? Yeah. Are you happy the sun was shining when you came in? Yeah. Absolutely. 
Well, I'm very happy to be here today, really excited and uh, feel privileged to introduce Dr. Suzanne Zinko. Uh, Dr. Zinko um, is a member of the Baptist Heart Specialist. You might have seen some of the promos that we've had out there. Uh, we recently, um, uh, associ Baptist associated with the Southern Heart Group and also the Jacksonville Heart Center to form Baptist Heart Specialists. It's a 27 physician uh, dynamo group practice, um, practicing in probably seven or eight different locations around the city. We, we cover a large territory. We feel we have the best cardiologist in the city. I know we have the best cardiologist in the city, Dr. Zenko being one of them. A little bit about Dr. Zenko. She received her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia. She completed an internship and residency in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Health System in Philadelphia. Then she went on to complete a fellowship in non-invasive cardiology at Cornell Medical Center in New York. Um, she is involved in our HeartWise program, which we had the, the pull-up out there, some of you saw, and we'll talk about that a little towards the end of the program here. Uh, we have our HeartWise program. It's a program, an assessment program designed just for women. Um, also, Dr. Zenko, you'll look at her and you'll think, certainly she's not old enough to be a cardiologist, but <laughs> I can assure you she's a very good one. And she is the mother of twin boys who are very young. She had those babies not too long ago. So if you'll please just welcome Suzanne Zenko. Tell Amanda that my business cards are in my bag if she needs them. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Susan, for the introduction. Actually, I think I'm like you. So, thank you all for coming. This is really exciting to see so many people here. It makes my stage fright worse, but <laughs> very exciting because this is a very important topic, and I'm very happy to be able to share this with you and hopefully raise awareness. Um, so let's get on with it. Let me see how. Okay. So what is heart disease, or more specifically, or more to be more medically precise, what is cardiovascular disease? So I'm not going to do a lot of technical or scientific uh, slides, but if you'll humor me, just one uh, coming up right after this. But basically, the cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular disease involves not only the heart but all the blood vessels associated with it. So basically, any disease that involves the entire circulatory system, that includes heart disease, which can result in heart attacks, uh, cerebrovascular disease, which can result in a stroke, high blood pressure is included in that, congestive heart failure, and peripheral arterial disease. And hopefully most of you have heard of at least some of these, and so you can be sort of familiar. This is just, like I said, the, the scientific part, just a little bit of it so that uh, you see what we're talking about. I work well with visual aids, so I figured I'd put up a picture. The top is... Um, let me see if I have a pointer here. Does it come up? No. Um, uh, the top blood vessel, it's just a cross-section of an open blood vessel that's normal. The bottom one, as you can tell, has something that doesn't belong there, a little yellow plaque. So that's fatty buildup uh, that builds up in your arteries as we age or you know, with, with other uh, disease processes that we'll talk about. Progressively, that gets you know, tighter and tighter and uh, narrows the blood vessel, and so the supply of blood gets less to the organs or the, the rest of the blood vessels that are connected to it downstream. And that's where the problem arises because then you don't get enough blood flow and you have all sorts of problems. If you have this plaque buildup in the, heart, in the arteries supplying the heart, it's called coronary artery disease. If that blockage closes down completely, you get a heart attack. And that's how that happens. If the plaque burden is in the uh, blood vessel supplying the brain, it's called cerebrovascular disease. If that blocks off completely, you get a stroke, or sometimes a mini stroke, it's called a TIA. This can happen anywhere in your body. It's not just uh, limited to the heart or the, you know, the, the, the brain. It can happen in any blood vessel, any organ. If you have blockages in those areas, then you can you know, lose limbs, you can have your kidneys not function well. Every organ can be affected by this disease. So why should women in particular be concerned? Um, this is something that involves both men and women. It's not just uh, limited to women. Uh, but I'm going to show you a couple of very scary slides. At least they were scary to me. 
um, when I was putting them together. So the reason we should worry and the reason we should all be here talking about this is because heart disease and cardiovascular disease in general is the leading cause of death in U.S. women. Okay. 25% over there is heart disease. The 7% is from stroke. If you put that together, that's 32%. So a full third of all women's death is from cardiovascular disease. Okay, 22%, that's all cancers combined. So let me say that again so that we all understand. More women die every year from heart disease than all cancers combined. And that's sort of an eye-opening statistic because we're all very worried about and very aware of things like breast cancer and uh, things like that. So not to underplay that all because obviously breast cancer is a very real issue and cancers in general are a very scary topic, but I just want to point out how really affected women are by heart disease. So the yellow line in that graph um, is heart disease that affects women. The Vertical or the horizontal line at the bottom is your age. So actually what this shows that at every age group more women die from heart disease than anything else and That again is a scary statistic. So, you know, I think we, We're all pretty much aware of the uh, cancers that women are prone to such as breast cancer or ovarian cancer or you know um, uh, cervical cancer. So we all see our gynecologists routinely get a pap smear, we line up for our mammograms and things like that. But far, far fewer women are aware of the uh, problem that heart disease poses and get screened for it. So I'm hoping that with uh, what I'm sharing with you today, that may change and people can be more aware and see your doctor um, to just get screened for this. Okay, so for years there was an erroneous perception uh, that heart disease affected predominantly men. And we as doctors were also held to blame for this because we thought the same. And we treated women differently, um, and we didn't think that it affected women as much as men. That is completely false, unless you're a premenopausal woman, in which case you have less uh, uh, risk of heart disease. However, after menopause, a woman's risk drastically increases, okay, to the point where since 1985 that we've been tracking this and really recognizing the burden of heart disease in women, we know that more women than men die of heart disease every year. Okay? The blue line is men, the red line is women. So if you look at it just sort of from, a, you know, from afar, you can see a pretty disturbing trend. The men, as we recognize uh, heart disease and we're better at treating it and preventing it and we you know, get people aware, their mortality is actually decreasing. Look at what the women are doing. We're staying the same, we're getting higher. Okay? So that, this to me tells us we have a lot of work to do. We're not very good at preventing or treating heart disease and we have to do a better job. So as if we didn't already know from life in general, women are different. And this is uh, the, also the case when it comes to heart disease. Women are more likely to be affected by this in, in, uh, and in more serious ways. Women are more likely to die suddenly of heart disease with no previous warning signs. Men tend to have the um, you know, typical angina symptoms beforehand to clue you in that something is going wrong. For whatever reason, women tend to prevent, present more suddenly and have more catastrophic events. Women also don't do as well with heart disease treatments as men because they're generally older when it is discovered and older people don't tolerate all the medicines and all the procedures and everything else that needs to happen necessarily. So, and also a woman is more likely to be debilitated than a man from a heart attack or a stroke of the same size. So it's pretty scary. Um, and uh, I think that part of the reason that all of this happens is this last point right here. Heart disease in women often goes unrecognized because there are so many atypical symptoms that women have. So we need to all be cognizant of that. Um, and I think that that last point is actually where we can make a difference. If we can learn the signs and symptoms of a heart attack in women or of the presentation of heart disease, recognize it earlier, we can treat it earlier and maybe do a better job um, uh, for these women and have, let, let them have better lives down, uh, down the line. So here's some sobering statistics. One in 25 women will die of breast cancer, while one in two to three will die of heart disease. Okay? So it's a very real and very big problem. Uh, the rate of heart disease in, in women raise, rises two to threefold after menopause. So I already touched on that. If you're premenopausal, you're protected. However, after menopause, so in your late 50s, 
women have a very, very high risk of heart disease. Uh, and the risks are higher for African American and Hispanic women. Um, that, that's genes, um, and actually we're not entirely sure uh, of a lot of the factors, but that, that is just the, the, the trend. So we need to do something about this, um, and that something is prevention. Okay? We need to recognize it earlier, we need to decrease our risk factors, and we need to be very good about and proactive um, about getting ourselves screened. We're all busy today. I mean, women today, most of them have full-time jobs, they're full-time wives, you know, mothers, what you take care of the house, everything else, everything's on your shoulders and you find very little time for yourself. And I think that's what needs to change. At some point we need to just realize what a big problem this is and if we ignore it for long term we'll have uh, major problems down the line. So um, everyone needs to recognize this, myself included, and we need to find some time uh, to focus on our own health, get screened, assess our own risk, and do something to minimize it. Okay, so now that you know you know what a big problem this is. What can we do about it? Number one, we can know the symptoms of a heart attack so that we get help sooner, so that we recognize the symptoms before we have a catastrophic event. Know the risk factors, more specifically know your own risk factors, and minimize them. So we'll go through some of this stuff and hopefully give you guys a guideline as to what to look for and, and how to go about uh, uh, avoiding problems. So what are the uh, warning signs of a heart attack? So although I just got done telling you that women often present atypically, still the majority of women do have the same symptoms as men, which is that crushing chest pain in the middle of your chest. It can come and go, or it can just come, in, come and uh, stay for longer than five minutes, typically is what we're more concerned about. You can have other symptoms with it, such as shortness of breath. Um, this type of pain usually gets worse with, exer with exertion, uh, but sometimes not. So it's definitely something to look for. It can be a sign that a heart attack is happening. Now, women, like I said, are way more likely to have atypical symptoms. So you don't get that elephant standing on your chest. That's, that's uh, the sign that we're all taught to look for. You can have pain uh, in your arms, your back, up to your jaw your stomach even, and no chest pain whatsoever. Same thing with shortness of breath, shortness of breath without chest discomfort, okay? So if you're noticing that you used to be able to do all this stuff and now all of a sudden, that is, you know, as soon as you try, you're short of breath, that's a, a problem that needs to be checked out. Um, women can break out in cold sweat, have nausea, vomiting, or lightheadedness, and that's their only symptom of a heart attack. So. If you or somebody you're with has any of these symptoms for longer than five minutes, don't delay, call 911, get help. So what are the risk factors? Um, and what can we do to modify them? So the first two up top, age and family history, are called non-modifiable risk factors. You can't change them. As we all know, you can't uh, reverse your aging. You can't choose who you're related to and what genes you inherit, although sometimes you'd like to. The rest of them, however, then give us hope because we can do something about all the rest of them. Smoking, big no-no. High blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and physical inactivity. I'm not telling you anything you guys don't already know. You've all heard about all these things and you know that they're you know, bad for you and that they need to be controlled and modified. Um, just sort of hoping to put it up there and uh, put it together in a picture and, and give you a goal to work for. So the number one preventable risk of many diseases, including heart disease, is smoking. 50% of heart attacks among women are due in some way to smoking. Smokers tend to have their first heart attack 10 years earlier than non-smokers. So that really shortens your lifespan. Um, they're four to six times more likely to suffer a heart attack, and they have an increased risk of stroke. Now, if you combine these together, um, women who smoke and take birth control pills, which are a risk in and of themselves, increase their risk of heart disease 30 times. So, if you smoke, you need to quit, okay? Uh, many people can't do this on their own, or you know, they, they try to, but they relapse, and that's okay. Keep trying it, keep doing it. Um, there, they, we now have programs to help you quit. We have medication to help you quit, from the gum to the patch. 
uh, and other medicines to help cut down on the craving. So see your doctor, get help, but quit. Um, the other major problem, and it's a very common problem, is high blood pressure. Obviously, this becomes more of a problem as we age or as we have other, uh, other diseases because a lot of things go hand in hand, and once you develop something, you're more prone to getting something else, and high blood pressure goes along with that. So high blood pressure, the definition really is if the top number or the systolic value is greater than 140, the bottom number or diastolic is greater than 90. And the typical way that we diagnose this is we check your blood pressure two weeks apart. If it's found to be high both those times, that gives you a diagnosis of high blood pressure. And this is something you can do on your own as well. Go to any CVS, Walgreens, put your arm in that automated cuff that they have, get your blood pressure checked and see what it is, okay? And if you find it to be elevated, see your doctor. Have them confirm it with the, with the manual way of taking it. Women are after age 85 are more likely than men to have high blood pressure. And again, African-American women are particularly at high risk. So what can we do about high blood pressure? One, like I said, you can check yourself. Make sure you, you know, do or don't have it. If you do have elevated blood pressure, and elevated blood pressure is in the 130s, so the top number isn't quite at 140, but if it's in the mid to high 130s, even that's elevated. Because ideally, we'd like it in the 120s. So if you do have elevated blood pressure, lose weight if you're overweight. And we'll talk about some ways to do this uh, a little bit later in the talk. Exercise regularly. You'd actually be surprised if I put somebody on a treadmill and I check their blood pressure beforehand, I have them exercise, and then I, you, know, you do your cool down period, you stop, their blood pressure comes down to significantly lower levels than before they started, and that persists for hours. So this is why we tell you to exercise and that will lower your blood pressure. Avoid excessive alcohol. What's excessive? So the American Heart Association uh, recommends no more than one glass for a woman a day and no more than two a day for, for men. Decrease your salt intake. This is a huge problem and we, don't, um, we oftentimes don't even realize it. I ask a lot of my patients about how much salt they're using and many of them tell me, none, I don't add any salt to my food. Read the labels when you're buying things. That's where it is. Okay? So canned products in general have tons of salt tomato-based products, tomato sauce. Pick up a can of tomato sauce and look at the back of it. It's got a lot of sodium. So, you know, even, even if you don't necessarily add salt to your cooking, um, look at the ingredients you're using and try to, try to opt for the low salt alternatives, okay? And finally, if you've done all this stuff and you still have higher blood pressure, talk to your doctor about medicines. They work, okay? Um, some people, I think, oftentimes have the perception that, well, I, I don't want to take medicines because once I start, I can't come off. And that's not the case. My own personal feeling is I want to get your blood pressure under control first, talk to you about all these diet and lifestyle modifications, get you to do it, and then try to take you off the pills and see if I can. But in that time, in those few months, you're still protected and your blood pressure isn't high. Obesity. We all know about this. <laughs> so... <laughs> after we just served you a yummy lunch, right? <laughs> um, and it's, it's no wonder obesity is such, a high, you know, such high rates uh, in this country. Um, between all the fast food we eat and the sedentary lifestyles that, that we have, um, it's, it's a big problem. So now this data is a little bit out of date, but it makes a big point, and I couldn't find one just like it um, for, uh, for the most recent years. But uh, look at the prevalence of obesity in 1991. I, you probably can't read that very clearly, but um, most of the U.S., the pre in most of the U.S., the prevalence was 10 to 14 percent. Ten years later, the prevalence was 20 to 24 percent. And we all know that obesity has just been on the rise since, so I honestly can't even imagine the numbers today. But it's a big problem. And it's not just how you feel, how you look. It's a real issue in terms of heart disease because um, so this, this bar graph, basically, um, on the horizontal axis, you have your weight um, uh, in increasing intervals. And on the vertical axis is your risk of death. So basically what this shows us is that as the heavier you are, the more likely we are to die of heart disease. Okay. So, you know, lots of people try um, and then they give up because it's, it's one of the hardest things to do, and I'm not gonna minimize that. I understand that everybody does. Um, but I, I sort of wanna bring home the fact that it has to be a 
conscious and hopefully permanent lifestyle decision. So the reason that fad diets don't work is because it's a temporary thing. So you know you you work your tail off for a couple of months and you don't you know you don't eat anything fried and you stay away from McDonald's and you do a great job and you exercise and then wow I can get into my skinny jeans and so I'm gonna go celebrate with ice cream. And not to say that you can't cheat once in a while, but it needs to be sort of a concerted effort where you make a real lifestyle change and you keep it that way to keep the weight off. Because if you go back to your old lifestyle you gain it back, shockingly. So, um, you know, exercise in general, like I touched on before, is very important. Active women can reduce their risk of heart disease by up to 50%. So it's an important thing. Um, if you've tried all this and you've, and you've really done a great job, you think, of, of uh, dieting and exercising and you still just can't lose the weight, there's uh, surgical options these days. Some are more invasive than others, but there are other options to help take the weight off. So, again, see your doctor and discuss all of this. Diabetes, another biggie. Um, very prevalent these days uh, among men as well as women. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's everywhere and it's a big risk factor for heart disease. So diabetes increases the risk of heart disease three to seven fold in women, less so in men. To tell you the truth, we don't know why. Um, diabetic women who smoke have an 84 higher, 84 uh, percent higher risk of having a stroke than non-smokers. So again, once you start adding the risk factors together, it increases your risk exponentially. And two out of three people with diabetes die from cardiovascular diseases, particularly heart disease and stroke. Way more have complications uh, in their peripheral arteries, so you end up having, you know decreased sensation, some people have to have amputations, so all this comes out from uh, poorly controlled diabetes. Now what can you do about it? Well, we can do a better job of controlling diabetes. You know, you and your doctor together can get together and, and uh, really get a handle on this. So I like my patients to be informed. I, I would sit down with you and tell you, know, tell you here's your number. And so what we take a look at is hemoglobin A1C, which gives us a measure of how well your sugar is controlled over a three month period. And I like my patients to know this number because it gives them a goal and a target to work for. So, you know, if it's out of the range that I'd like it to uh, be in, we'll talk about some strategies, how to get it down, um, particularly sugar, you know, sugars, your intake of sugars, um, and regular exercise. And uh, hopefully the next time I check it, three, or three to six months later, it'll be down. And so it's, it, I think it works well as a target uh, value for people. Um, see your doctor get medications if needed, and they very uh, often are. Again, if you're diabetic and you're overweight, I'll oftentimes if you lose a lot of weight, you can at least cut down, if not come off of your uh, diabetic medications. So a lot of these problems go hand in hand. And uh, keeping diabetes under control delays other complications down the line, like kidney and eye disease, nerve damage, things like that. Uh, another biggie, cholesterol, we've all heard about this. Uh, this graph is uh, just meant to show you that as your cholesterol level increases, so does your risk of heart disease. All right, so it's pretty, pretty directly correlated. Now, what is cholesterol? Um, there's three components in cholesterol. The HDL is the good cholesterol. Um, the bad cholesterol is the LDL. So this is that waxy substance that I showed you that coats the blood vessels and eventually uh, causes blockages. The HDL is is the good cholesterol because it actually, so you can think of it as sort of clears it out a little bit. So it does pick up some of that bad cholesterol and brings it back to the liver so that it can be excreted out of the body. Um, it's not going to do that, you know, all the way. It's not like it's going to clean out the plugged arteries, but it does help. Triglycerides is the last component. It's also involved uh, in heart disease, but we do tend to focus more on the HDL and the LDL. Okay. What can you do to help control your cholesterol. Know your numbers. I can't stress that enough. I mentioned it with the hemoglobin A1C for diabetics, the same thing with uh, blood pressure, and now your cholesterol, okay? Um, we, you know, we all have primary care doctors. You can just have, make sure you have your cholesterol checked and know the numbers. If you look at that slide, I purposely made the total cholesterol smaller than the rest of it because it's not the total cholesterol that matters. It's the breakdown, okay? So I, you should know what your bad cholesterol is, what your good cholesterol is, and what your triglycerides are. Um, because really what, uh, the, the level to which we treat depends on the breakdown. Okay. You're more likely to have high cholesterol if you have an unhealthy diet. That's a no-brainer. If you have high blood pressure or if you smoke. If you are obese, 
if you have diabetes, if you don't exercise, if you drink too much alcohol, or if you just have it in your genes. All right, but I hope you guys are getting the picture that all of these are really intertwined. So where should your goal be? Um, the triglycerides look like they've fallen off the slide, but um, your LDL, your bad cholesterol, if you're young and healthy and you have no risk factors and, and you just, you know, no real family history, we'd like it to be less than 160. If you have diabetes or known heart disease, less than 100. If you've had heart attacks or uh, really bad heart disease, less than 70. But I mean, I'm just giving you this as a ballpark so that you're familiar with where the range of the numbers is. This is up to, you know, this, this is something that we have to remember. You guys don't. The HDL, the good cholesterol, we want uh, greater than 40 for men and greater than 50 for women. So uh, the next one, physical activity. This, this is a tough one to get people to do. Everybody knows it. Well, we, we all, none of us want to hear it because it's hard to do. So the uh, American Heart Association recommends 30 minutes of vigorous exercise on most days or all days uh, of the week. Okay? Physical activity or just getting you know, regular exercise in general will control your cholesterol. It increases the good cholesterol and decreases the bad cholesterol. It controls your, uh, helps to control the diabetes. Obviously, you lo you'll lose weight, so it, uh, it controls obesity. Helps lower blood pressure, like I mentioned. It can reduce your risk of a heart attack up to 50%. And it may even reduce the risk of certain cancers, uh, some of the data suggests. So you can really do yourself a lot of good, plus it makes you feel good. It gives you a lot more extra energy. You know, it just really uh, makes a big difference. So exercise. I know we're all busy but we have to find that time, okay? Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to go join a gym. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's a pretty, uh, we should print that out and like have that in our little cubicles and everywhere for, for inspiration. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go join a gym and you know, spend an entire hour every day um, uh, exercising. If you ride an elevator, get off two floors early and walk the rest of the time, you know, the rest of the way. Or if you're driving to work, park a block away and briskly walk that last block. Find some way to add a little bit of extra exercise to your day, and it'll make a difference. Okay, so just to sort of bring home the point and put everything on one slide, how do you reduce all of your risk factors and ultimately reduce your risk of heart disease and stroke down the line? Number one really number one, two, and three in my book, don't smoke. Stay physically active. Exercise as much as you can. Maintain a healthy weight. Eat a heart-healthy diet. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides. Um, uh, the Mediterranean diet has gotten a lot of press lately. Um, or the DASH diet, which is the seasoning that's not salty. Um, control your blood pressure and cholesterol. And then talk to your doctor and see if you should be taking an aspirin or fish oil. So we talked a lot about diets. What foods should you avoid? And again, this isn't, and this isn't anything new that most of you haven't heard about, but I'll go through it just, just to really reinforce it. So things that are really bad for your heart, red meat. Um, the, uh, so beef, obviously. Uh, pork is a healthier uh, meat. So if, uh, if, if you want some sort of non-white meat, pork is a better option. Um, high fat dairy like sour cream, cream cheese, full fat, you know, um, full fat version of these. Processed cheese, butter, whole milk. Uh, Danish, Danishes, pastries, really any sort of uh, really yummy <laughs> desserts are on the list. <laughs> Sorry to tell you. Okay, fried foods, those, these are the dreaded trans fats that we hear a lot about. They're, uh, they're a hot uh, topic these days. Um, and uh, white car uh, or simple carbohydrates in the form of white starches. So anything white, white rice, white bread, white pasta. Um, you, it's a much safer, or much he heart healthier alternative to drink to, to eat the uh, whole grain versions of these. So things that we should eat: lots of fruits and vegetables. Okay, fish at least twice a week. Salmon, tuna, herring, sardines, halibut, and mackerel are a good, um, a good option in particular because they have a lot of the omega-3 fatty acids that help increase your good cholesterol. Whole grain bread, cereals, and pastas, like I mentioned, instead of the full-fat dairy products, switch to the low-fat ones, yogurt, cottage cheese, you know, low-fat or uh, non-fat milk. 
use egg whites um, or egg substitutes and you know skinless uh, uh, poultry. Nuts, a lot of nuts are also uh, very high in omega-3 fatty acids, so they're very good for your cholesterol um, and your heart in general. And then steam as opposed to fry your food. That will go a long way to decreasing your um, fat intake. So just other recommendations uh, for women, specifically from the American Heart Association that we may have come across or, or uh, that there might have been some conflicting information uh, in recent years. Number one, should I take an aspirin? For men, for most men, with any sort of risk factors, really, we end up putting you on a baby aspirin, and it's pretty standard because the data is there that we know that if we put you on this baby aspirin, we typically reduce the risk of heart attack down the line. Turns out this is not the same for women. We do still recommend that for women that have known heart disease or have diabetes. They should, help, uh, they should still take uh, baby aspirin um, on a daily basis to help prevent heart attacks. However, if you're a healthy woman, um, especially under the age of 65, or you just have you know, high blood pressure or just uh, you know, one risk factor, you actually don't benefit as much. You, t you tend to do yourself more harm in terms of bleeding and side effects from the aspirin than good. So always talk to your doctor and see if, if uh, this is recommended for you. What about hormone replacement therapy? So a few years back, 15 years back, it was a big trend. Postmenopause women got put on you know, estrogen replacement therapy um, because the, the thought was, well, after menopause, all these hormonal changes predispose us to more heart disease. We get osteoporosis. So if we replace those hormones, those effects should be mitigated. Turns out that's not the case. There was a big study called the Women's Health Initiative, which uh, looked at specifically this. And women that uh, use hormone replacement therapy have an increased risk of stroke, heart disease, and blood clots. So we don't recommend it at all. The only time that I will sort of twist my arm, say, okay, is if uh, a woman in the uh, in the throes of menopause has a lot of symptoms and it was really uncomfortable, I don't want you to be miserable. So um, I will then say okay to a short-term course of hormone replacement therapy and typically this is considered to be short-term if it's less than five years. After that, get you off. How about other supplements? Folic acid and other antioxidants like vitamin E, C, beta carotene. We've done studies, turns out these are not helpful. Um, and they don't help to prevent heart disease. Omega-3 fatty acids are a different story. We do think that these are helpful in preventing uh, cardiovascular disease, specifically in people who have high cholesterol or triglycerides. Um, women, as, you know, women uh, as well as men, actually. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are definitely helpful in people who have heart disease and who have had heart attacks, so we definitely recommend it for them. Um, in terms of how much omega-3 fatty acid you need, if you look at the bottle, look at the uh, active ingredient, you need 1,800 milligrams a day of the active ingredient called EPA. Okay, over-the-counter supplements are not um, standardized, so not, you know, they don't all have the same amount. You have to actually read the label. Um, the only one that is standardized is called Lavaza. It's a prescription-only one, um, and, uh, and that, that you'll have to get through your doctor again. But that's, uh, that's the skinny on that. So I hope I've sort of gotten across the, uh, the, uh, the point that prevention is the best way to really address this problem. Uh, women are more affected by heart disease than we realize, um, and uh, we're, we're very severely affected by it uh, if it does happen. So good diet, regular exercise, and minimizing your risk factors is really key. Um, and Hopefully, just stay aware of it. You know, keep it in the forefront of your mind. Add it to your yearly checklist of pap smear and mammogram. Get my cholesterol check. Get check my blood pressure. Screen for diabetes. Make sure that I don't have a high risk of heart disease. So, see your doctor. Get checked, and stay healthy. So, with that, thank you. I'm gonna give the podium back to Susan. Yeah. Did everybody learn something? Yeah, I did too. Actually, I learned something. I learned definitely something I need to make a change about. I'll have to tell you about it later. Um, uh, before we take questions, I just wanted to go over a couple of slides with you. You know, one of the things, I'm not sure if you mentioned this in this talk or not, but 
about 80% of cardiovascular disease can be avoided if you start young. So all of the changes that she's talking about, if you had started young, or if I had started young, uh, we could avoid much of the cardiovascular disease. One of the things that I've learned working uh, with fine physicians like Dr. Zanko is that women our age here, we're all of a mature age, most of us, um, the, all of our lifestyle, um, you know, our bad lifestyle things that we have done, it, it builds up over the years and then cardiovascular disease hits us. Um, had we known about this at a younger age, we could have done something about that. So how many of you here have daughters or granddaughters who are like 20, 30, 40 years old? I bet a lot. They need to be hearing this, in my opinion, not just women our age. At Baptist, we have put together a program. It's a cardiac assessment. And um, we don't really call it a screening, but we really call it a cardiac assessment. It's a one-hour appointment with a nurse uh, or a physician assistant that is supervised by our medical director, who is Dr. Pam Rama, and also Dr. Zanko um, is involved in that too, as well as Dr. Shannon Liu, three really great female cardiologists. Um, during this appointment, I'll just go over it really briefly. You come in, you have a finger stick times two. They start running your blood through these little machines called Cholestex. One of them is for your lipid profile, your blood sugar. The other is for a C-reactive protein. Then there's an EKG that's done. Then there is an assessment that's done, question, answer. The um, physician assistant is entering your answers. And then uh, she enters in all the blood values and such. And then uh, what comes out is what your heart age is. And you saw our literature out there. Um, about know your heart age, know your numbers, know your heart age, know what goes into this. So we offer this one hour appointment, it's $69, it's a cash thing, it's not insurance paid or anything. But if you are interested, you can call 202 No to find out about it. And especially if you have daughters, it makes a great gift. You can go online and buy a gift certificate for this assessment. I don't have a daughter, I have a son. If I had a daughter, I would have her doing this right now. Um, after the appointment, we keep in touch with you with Facebook, some emails. Um, we have other resources put together, uh, different classes that we're continually refining and putting together. Um, as we learn more from the women that we're seeing, we're responding to what their needs are, what their desires are by putting together those educational packets. We have a fitness center at the Wolfson's uh, Fitness Center um, at our downtown campus. It's wonderful where we can do a fitness assessment to some in, anybody who's interested. Uh, we have a smoking cessation program. We have uh, lots of small group classes on nutrition and such. And uh, Dr. Zenko talked about nutrition in the Mediterranean diet. And one of the things that we're, we're just starting next week, as a matter of fact, will be our very first one. We're offering a two-hour class at our Baptist Beaches location um, that you could, if you're interested, go online and uh, sign up for. It's $20, and uh, we'll be following up, talking about the Mediterranean diet, um, or the components of the Mediterranean diet, but it's really a heart-healthy diet in which there are several components from the Mediterranean diet that you've all been reading about. So, um, before we take questions, I want to remind you that you have a sheet of paper at your table. If you're interested in any more information about Baptist or any of our services, if you are interested in a heart screening, um, such as the one that I spoke about, you can list that on there. And before you leave, if you leave those at the back table, we would appreciate that. Or if you have any comments, things that you're interested to learning about, we would love to, to have that information from you. So um, Dr. Zanko can take questions now, if you want to come back up, because I really cannot answer your questions. <laughs> I want to ask you a question concerning, you said evasive and non-invasive. Would you explain what that is? Excuse me? You were saying something about they do non-invasive surgeries or whatever, uh, and evasive. What does that mean? Oh, okay. So um, uh, maybe I should, I should revise my statement. Minimally invasive and invasive. Okay. So um, there's, uh, there's different ways to uh, do, it's called the whole, the whole 
field is called bariatric surgery, but um, they can do uh, lap bands where they just basically put a band around your stomach uh, to, to sh shrink down a part of it so that you're full faster um, and that really helps a lot with weight loss. So that's not an actual surgery, that's a, that's a, that's a smaller procedure. Um, you can do, uh, and then there's open sur uh, surgical procedures where they actually staple off parts of the stomach. Um, I'm not asking you about, I'm asking you about the word evasive and non-evasive. Oh, in terms of cardiology? Car it, anything. Okay, so. Because I hear this, I've heard, I've heard this before. Oh, okay, 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 I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. Know, I don't know so what evasive in, and non-evasive, what's the difference in okay, the two? Okay, so typically non-invasive is uh, something that doesn't involve uh, too much cutting or procedure or anything like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a test from the outside, usually ultrasounds, CAT scans, so diagnostic tests that don't involve procedures. Okay. Okay, and an invasive study then involves us actually going in there, you know, cardiac catheterization is a minimally invasive study, but it is. Okay. So, you know, we, we put a catheter in you and, uh, uh, you know, go take a look at that way, uh, but it's, it's still a procedure, so it's still called an invasive study. Okay. Okay, and then obviously surgeries are invasive. So the non-invasive ones are the ones that, you know, we just sort of scan you without doing anything to you. Thank you. I want to ask you, you, you didn't go along on the Mediterranean diet. I think basically what you were saying about omega-3s, is that extra olive oil and things that you eat and cheeses and things like that? So um, the Mediterranean diet is, uh, is, is very heavy in, the, in yes, like you said, um, omega-3 fatty acids. So overall, um, the Mediterranean diet basically cuts out red meat. It's a lot of fish, very fish-based diet. Um, some chicken, but you know, mostly it's, it's mostly a fish diet. Uh, no olive, oil, sorry, no uh, butter, no vegetable oil. It's mostly you know using olive oil. Uh, low in starch, low in fat, and high in uh, vegetables, fruits, things like that. A lot of nuts, and uh, and mostly raw things as opposed to you know fried or cooked or whatever. So. Um, that, that's what, I mean, it's, it's an entire science in and of itself, honestly. <laughs> sure. Hi. Hi. Um, you touched on hormone replacement therapy. And along those lines, I want to ask you about progesterone cream. Would you recommend that for uh, night sweats, for example? What is your take? Um, so... The, the, the combinations that have been studied were estrogen alone and estrogen and progesterone. Um, and, you know, to, to, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what progesterone is by itself um, in terms of, of long-term outcomes. Um, in general, like I said, we don't recommend it at all unless your symptoms are really severe. So to the point where you really can't tolerate it because you just never know. And the, the data that we do have is not good about it. Um, there is some uh, the debate out there, or controversy out there, about what's called bioidentical hormones. You guys might have heard of that. It's, uh, it's basically just a complex way of getting around to the same thing. And in the end, it's still, it's still not good for you. It's still the data is uh, conflicting somewhat. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you look at it objectively, and most endocrinologists agree, stay away from it. It's the same thing and has the same outcomes. Hi, there was a very long discussion on NPR this morning about the pros and cons of being treated with statins mm -hmm. before you should be. I mean, in many instances, the tests have said and the studies have proven that it really is not helping, it's not making a difference. You know, Lipitor, Crestor, only two out of 100 were dying. So, especially in a situation where you already have good control of your cholesterol, regardless of whether you have diabetes or not, should you be on these drugs? So I'm going to say yes. Um, and that's not a blanket statement to everybody. I don't, I mean, I don't really think it should be put in water. Um, but, uh, but I think people with the right uh, profile should have it. And that does include everybody with diabetes. And here's why. Um, outside of just collect, uh, uh, controlling your cholesterol and bringing down your cholesterol levels, Statins have anti-inflammatory properties. So recently we found, in the last few years, we found out that inflammation is general, in general is bad for your heart health. Uh, it causes the progression of heart disease at a much faster rate than we thought. So statins have an anti-inflammatory property. Um, they 
sort of, you can think about it as they stabilize that plaque that I showed you, the buildup of the fatty uh, streak on the inside of the blood vessel, they stabilize it. They don't de decrease it, it's, uh, well, minimally some of them, but um, for the most part, those plaques tend to stay, but what the statin does is it tends to form a fibrous plaque over the top of it so that it's less likely to burst and cause a heart attack. So anybody with diabetes, you're pretty much guaranteed to have at least some heart disease. It's, in fact, we consider it a, uh, a disease equivalent. So if you have diabetes, it's sort of understood you have heart disease. Maybe not obstructive to the point where we need something done about it and you're not necessarily you know, at risk for a heart attack tomorrow, but you have some fat buildup. So that's why we recommend anybody with diabetes take a statin. Um, I think statins get a lot of bad press because, mainly because so many people are on it. So then the side effects are more, you know, more common and you hear more about it. Um, there's a lot of different statins out there. They're uh, uh, metabolized and broken down in different ways. And so if you do have side effects from one, if you talk to your doctor, we can put you on another one that, has, that works from a different perspective or is, is, is uh, broken down by a different part of the body and hopefully won't give you the same side effects. Um, but anybody who has risk factors, family history, things like that, really should be on a statin. Now, if your cholesterol is just wonderful, um, then typically what, what I would do is I would check that uh, high sensitivity to CRP, which Susan mentioned, um, as a marker of your inflammation. And if your cholesterol is great and you don't have any extra inflammation in your body, then I wouldn't put you on a statin. But if, even if your cholesterol is great, if you have risk factors and that inflammatory marker is elevated, we know that putting you on a statin down the line will prevent heart attacks and strokes. I have a question about, um, I saw my doctor this past Monday, not yesterday, Monday before, and uh, at one o'clock I had an EKG done. But at 10 o'clock that night, I had an angina attack. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that have shown up on the EKG that day? No? No, because the EKG picks up the electrical activity in the heart right when it's done. And I'm trying real hard to see a cardiologist. They haven't called me with an appointment yet, but I really feel like I need a stress test because I just am not doing well. Anyway. Uh, that's, you know, if you're having chest pain, absolutely, I completely agree. You should definitely be evaluated by a cardiologist. Um, and we can, I mean, we, we're happy to see you and take care of you. Okay. Hi. Uh, my question is, can plaque buildup already in your arteries be decreased through uh, regular exercise, uh, Mediterranean diet, <clears throat> and Crestor, assuming someone already, uh, let's say a 65-year-old woman happens to have some uh, plus, you know, some buildup in the arteries already. Once it's already there. Um, so it's, that's, that concept is called plaque regression. And uh, the only thing it really does happen with is statins. So if, you're, if you take a statin with some of them, we can see plaque regression. Um, there's not, uh, it's not a lot of it. So that's why I try not to, not, I, I try not to sort of highlight it and say, if you take your statin, your plaque will go away, because that's just not the case. It'll decrease by a small percentage. Um, but no, there's no, there's no way to, to really clear it out. Um, the best you can do once you have it is, like I said, to stabilize it, make sure it doesn't progress, um, and, uh, and, and let it form that thick fibrous coating so that it's less likely to rupture and cause a heart attack, and that we do with statins. I've been taking uh, vitamin C for many years. Was your statement that we don't need to take vitamin C? Not, not to prevent heart disease or strokes. It doesn't, it doesn't do that. What good is it? What good oh, is it? Uh -huh. Vitamin, C is <laughs> <laughs> Vitamin C is helpful with your immunity, immune system. So actually, there's a, a lot of debate in, in medicine in general about taking vitamin supplements. And a lot of people take them because, you know, you just figure it's healthy. Um, it turns out that um, we don't have a whole lot of data to say that um, that, that, that is the case. Uh, things like, you know, vitamin B12 if you're anemic. Yes. Folate, if you're anemic, yes. Iron, if you're anemic, yes. But um, just taking, vit and obviously vitamin D and calcium has a lot of literature b b uh, about that. Uh, but um, a lot of times we just say, oh, you take your multivitamin um, and, and, you know, it certainly can't hurt, put it that way. But it's actually a much better idea to get it through your diet, to get it the natural way. So fruits and vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables have a lot of iron and 
um, chock full of vitamins. So we always recommend doing that as opposed to just relying on a multivitamin supplement. Uh, I have um, diabetes, high blood pressure, bad cholesterol. I have a heart murmur. My heart beats fast. So what do I have to watch out for? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I can just go back and start the talk over. <laughs> um, do you have a cardiologist? Do you see somebody? Because you absolutely should. Um, no, no I, I just see my regular doctor, my diabetes doctor. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think you should, um, you know, whether, whether you choose to, to have the, the screening program or just be referred straight to a cardiologist and be evaluated. I mean, I definitely think a cardiologist would need, would need to see you. Um, you know, I'm the, I don't do studies just to do studies, but anybody who's got a lot of risk factors or is having chest pain or some sort of symptoms, I think you need a stress test um, if, if that is the case. Not every test is perfect, um, and sometimes there's false positives, sometimes there's false negatives, and so I certainly won't do a test unless it's absolutely indicated. Um, but if you're having symptoms, if you're having problems and you have a lot of risk factors, such as it sounds like you do, um, you know, I think you need to be evaluated, and you won't know until you have it. Well, but yes, you're, you're at risk for pretty much every complication that I mentioned today. Dr. Zenko, yes. thank you very much. Uh, let's all give a round of applause to Dr. Zenko. Thank you. And if, um, if any of you are interested in learning more about cardiology at Baptist, if you go to ebaptisthealth.com and you can link right over to Baptist Heart Specialists where Dr. Zinko practices through that group. Um, and we'd love to hear from you and what your ideas and suggestions are. Thank you very much.